Okay, so uh, I'll do this in, this in English now. So welcome back, everybody. It's time to start again. Um, and this time I have the pleasure to introduce to you Tim Powell, uh, who is the creative producer at Historic Royal Palaces. And his focus is on how technology can be used uh, to deepen visitors' connection to historic spaces, stories and characters. And Tim will today speak about Holding a King's Heart, The Lost Palace and Touchly Feely Tech. Welcome, Tim. Good dag. That's the end of the Swedish. The rest is here. So, hello. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, we're going to talk about a project called The Lost Palace, which uh, we're very proud of. It's been a very big part of my life over the last few years. So, what we'd like to do is just share what we've learned, well, what we did, what we've learned, and what we're doing next. Do I need to slow down a little to start with? I've tried to put as many English, Swedish stereotypes in the presentation as I can find, so you can be the judge of that. To start, uh, Historic Royal Palaces uh, is an independent charity. We look after the six unoccupied royal palaces, the Tower of London, Hampton Court Palace, Kensington Kew, the Banqueting House, and Hillsborough Castle in Northern Ireland. And we welcome about 4.8 million visitors a year. We receive no state or crown funding, so all of our money is raised ourselves through ticket sales and fundraising and gift shops and, and, and those sorts of things. And we exist to help everyone explore the stories of how monarchs and people have shaped society in some of the greatest palaces ever built. Uh, I work in the public engagement department, um, and we produce the, the core visitor offer day to day, and also all of the kind of programmed events. Um, and the, the new direction we've been taking this in in the last few years is towards uh, the commissioning of new art and performance and collaborations with artists. And that's really in the spirit of, these, uh, of the history of these places. What they were places of spectacle. They were places that were built by the best architects, decorated by the best artists. Um, so it's really trying to continue the spirit of the, of the place. And people come to historic sites to travel back in time, to escape the real world. So the challenge for me in particular is how we use the kind of amazing storytelling power of digital technology without taking away from that kind of act of the imagination of our visitors. So the structure of the talk, I'll just talk through the Lost Palace project, the results, the process, the challenges we found, um, a little bit about the design principles we've developed as part of it and then what this means for the organization. So firstly, this is, this is Banqueting House on Whitehall. Uh, we think it's the greatest room in London. It's in, in, in Italian style, Flemish, a Flemish artist um, and built for a Danish queen. And um, it was built particularly for a specific type of court entertainment called the court mask, in which the whole royal court took place. And one of the highlights of that was um, the dancing queen Young and sweet, only 17. <laughs> there's more. Um, so this is the greatest room in London, but the trouble is that there's 1,499 rooms missing because that's Banqueting House, and that's Whitehall Palace, and the rest of it's gone. So it burnt down in 1698. Uh, it was 1,500 rooms, covered 23 acres, uh, and this is right in the heart of kind of landmark land of London. It's between uh, Trafalgar Square, Big Ben, and the Houses of Parliament. And the stories that happen there are really the greatest hits of English history. They are where Henry VIII met Anne Boleyn, where he married Anne Boleyn. It's where Shakespeare premiered lots of his, his plays. Uh, it's where Guy Fawkes was interrogated for the gunpowder plot. So, um, but no one knows about it. Millions of people walk up and down that road every day. And this is the obligatory Brexit slide. Um, the reason this, this building is so powerful for us is that uh, we, we exist, at, it's about the contemporary relevance of history. And the reason political power is in Whitehall, it's where Downing Street is, it's where all the Ministry of Defence and all the government buildings are, is because of this royal history. Uh, and it is still used today to be the place where the, the people speak, speak to power. So there's constant protests. And this project happened right in the middle of all the Brexit votes and all of that kind of stuff. So, um, so what did we do? How did we tell this story of this lost palace? Um, I'll just let this film introduce itself. The 
There should be some signs, actually. Debauchery that I hear tell of at the cock in for which you were indicted. Oh, no, between the dragon and his wrath! Sarah! Have you heard? The king is now besotted yeah. yeah. Queen Catherine's. Both that you may marry and that I may join you together in marriage. Things of a bad man. Show her here. And it was Her Majesty. Catherine of Braganza. Yes! Come on, Rochester. Break it. Come on, smash it. <laughs> So there we are, and it was, uh, these, these are the people I need to, to credit for this. Um, it was a, a collaboration between the interaction designers Chomka and Rosier, theatre company Uninvited Guests with sound artist Lewis Gibson and the software developers Calvium Limited. Um, we won an award. I'll come back to that though. Um, so behind it all is this device. It's strange, isn't it? It's a block of wood. So inside of there is, it uses GPS, it uses near field communication, there's haptics, it uses all of the gesture recognition of a, of a mobile phone, so um, gyroscope, accelerometer, um, but it's all hidden away in this block of wood. So none of it is visible other than the, the socket which you put your headphones in. Uh, and the, the other key innovation is, is binaural sound. Um, is that a familiar term to, to people? Um, the human, essentially binaural sound is, is the closest we get to replicating the way human sound works. So our ears are very good at knowing where, how far a sound is away and which direction it's in. So this whole, the head on a stick is a binaural microphone and it actually has the microphones in its ears. So when the actors are performing the scenes, they perform to the head, and when the listener is listening back, they feel the voices moving around them in the way that the actors moved around that original microphone. So um, it's also very good at um, capturing the acoustics of particular spaces. Um, and um, we also did one more thing with it, which was that the, the headphones that the people uh, were wearing had a microphone on them. So at, at times, we were able to turn that microphone on and so the, the sound of the world around them was treated with audio effects to make it sound like it was a historic space. It started in, in the Undercroft. Um, there's a giant model of the palace uh, and a light show, projection mapping light show. It showed how the palace grew over time. And around the walls, you saw the people who lived in that palace and, and what it would have been like, uh, the, the views, what the views would have been like. Uh, so the idea is that you were kind of stood within this, this lost palace. Uh, and then the route took people outdoors in England. <laughs> um, but it, and it really did take, that's the big building there is the Ministry of Defence, Downing Street, Horse Guards Parade. So it really was right through the, the, the centre of London. Um, and around the routes, people met these, these architectural installations. And they were inspired by the architecture that would have stood in those spots, so the architecture of parts of the palace. Um, and all of the physical stuff we built was, burnt, was uh, black burnt wood. So the idea is that they are the remains of this palace that, that, that burnt down. Um, and there were eight of these in, in total. The biggest was, as you saw in the video, the, the Great Hall Archway, which was 16 feet tall and weighs half a ton. Uh, and these are all lined with NFC tags. Um, essentially like um, uh, contactless payment type technology so that when people arrived at them they just touched the device to them and it triggered the scene that happened where in that spot. And just to mess with people's heads a little bit more, we had a live performer and the live performer was singing a contemporary version of a 17th century song. The visitors heard it in their head but the busker was actually miming. 
So if they took their headphones off, there was no sound, even though it was being produced. Um, so the interactions were that if we could take you to the place where the, where the story happened, we did, and we built something there, and you checked in. If we couldn't, we allowed you to find it with the device. Um, and then at certain points, we uh, forced you, encouraged you to take part in the story. So you saw the, the, the uh, sword fighting. Uh, if you did the adult version, um, the, the device became a cockerel at one point, and you had to shake the cockerel before throwing it into the ring for a cockfight, which is historically accurate. Um, so just to say that this, um, it was a daytime family-friendly version, and then in the evenings we ran an adult version uh, as well, which was very not family-friendly. It was really nice to be able to do something um, like that. And we ran it over two summers, so 2016 and 2017. So the results were just tremendous for us. So um, of people who rated it very effective or effective, the technology was 98%, storytelling 94, practical delivery 97. Um, and these were the kind of the, the questions we asked that we wanted to measure. So 93% uh, strongly agreed or agreed that it was unique to other experiences they'd had at visitor attractions, 95 that it brought the history of this time and place to life, and 91 that it made me feel connected to the past and history here. And it also, 38% uh, were aged 16 to 34, and 59% were under 44, which is, a, 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 which is an unusual audience for, for Heritage, and exactly the one we sought. And I'm really pleased to say that there's no of, you saw that it requires you to take part, it's an active experience, and there was no correlation between age and how much people were willing to take part, which I thought, which was one of the most pleasing outcomes, actually. Um, a number of media reviews um, that really, um, we were pleased with the reviews because they really um, identified what we were setting out to do, uh, which is kind of, you know, the, the act of imagination. And pleased to say that we won the Innovation Prize at the Museums and Heritage Awards and the um, Best Overall Achievement at Heritage in Motion European Awards this year. Um, now, this section is about the process. I'll stop boasting now. Um, and this is how it all began, actually. So this is it's a very, very complicated map. But the grey is the, is the area now, and the green and uh, red are the historic bits. And what we had to do, really, is to see if the stories that happened are in places we can take people to, because otherwise, um, otherwise we don't have a visitor experience. Um, there were some really nice outcomes as well, in that the bear fighting pit is actually located in the garden of 10 Downing Street, <laughs> which is very good. And if you, uh, just, just out of sight here is, is a bridge, and that's Waterloo. Oh, maybe more. Um, so how did we do this? We started um, uh, with an open call. Rather than writing a brief and telling, what, telling the people what we wanted, we said to the creative industries, how can we do this? And we really did push it out widely. So we had um, applicants from dance, from, um, well, across the creative industries. 3.5 thousand views of this, sorry, 3,000 views of this online. We had over 100 uh, organizations come in and had 90 full submissions. Um, and what we'd asked for is that it was a collaboration. And it really was a com competition. So, um, but what we did was uh, chose the five best prototypes and we made them. And we recruited through social media 30 uh, tester groups and we invited them in over a summer to test these things. And um, what we found is that two of them were the most popular. So, we, so it wasn't a case that the winner takes it all. Um, <laughs> uh, do you want me to stop or carry on? I, I can carry on. We've got loads of them. <laughs> um, these, these were the start. These were the first beating hearts. This is right at the beginning. These are the first versions of this. So, um, so of these... Um, Five, two were most popular, and we asked them to collaborate. Um, this was a British artist who, who uh, did this little installation in an IKEA store uh, based on how many couples have arguments in IKEA. So I was looking at um, how you get groups of disparate people to get on together over a project, and this, this came to mind. So 
Forming the collaboration was one of the challenges because this was a theater company, a software development company, and a design company. And we also had to meet deadlines for planning permission. And all of, also, it was a whole set of worlds, uh, different worlds of working. Um, and the process was, these are lots of buzzwords, I know, but it was uh, an iterative development process. We did 15 plus rounds. So each of those interactions uh, was prototyped first and then tested with, with real audiences. Um, and kill your baby chickens is, is something we really learned that you have to do. We had this interaction which was about, it was a mixture of scan and proximity and, and we thought it was the cleverest thing in the world and all people could do is find chicken noises and it was horrible. So we had to put it in the bin. Um, and when we launched it to the public, we very much saw the year one as a prototype. So even though it was a ticketed uh, sold event, um, we, weren't we weren't proposing that it was the finished version, so, so year two was um, an improvement. Not perfect, nothing ever is. Um, and I, and I th one of the things I, is digital design uses the phrase minimum viable product a lot. And, and we get sold that idea an awful lot. And it has its value, I understand, but I think there's, it, we must be very careful that there's a big difference between a minimum viable product and a minimum viable visitor experience. And they're absolutely not the same thing. So we mustn't put those minimum viable products in front of our trusted audiences. Um, the, other, the other big challenge was working with Whitehall stakeholders. This was a time when there were numerous terrorist attacks in London, um, and we had to form a security liaison group. And um, I'll tell you later on about the anecdotes of two of the developers being detained under the Prevention of Terrorism Act at gunpoint. True. Um, but we, we worked with the um, security forces of the area um, Little things like the angle of the installations we, we changed so that CCTV could see either side um, and the colors of the devices. They were originally going to be all black, but they said that will look like a gun on CCTV. Okay. Um, so by the end of it, by the time we actually had thousands of people walking around the streets, um, even the coppers on the beat knew what was, what was going on. Um, so. This section now is about the challenges we've found. Um, does it actually, do you kind of get what it is now? <laughs> I guess it's quite hard to explain, so hopefully I've done that. But, um, so the challenge is, this was the first marketing image we, we, we produced. We thought it was great, but it really didn't work. Um, and finding the, the language to sell this new type of experience really did prove a challenge. And when we did the analysis on how people found out how people found out about it, 47% uh, found out through word of mouth, which is great because it means people liked it and told their friends, but word of mouth is very slow, you know? Um, and so word of mouth works by the time you're about to close it. Um, and 25% were through social media, but more traditional advertising like, like print adverts or leaflets and all the rest of it, it's only about 4% of people actually, actually found out about it through those. And not everyone likes new stuff. So this, was a tr this was an actual visitor comment. Tosh is rubbish, by the way. So, and th there's a serious point here, which is about making sure that you communicate uh, to your core audiences, which might be more traditional, uh, that this is something that is slightly different. Because we, you know, we must value our core audiences absolutely, um, but we also don't want to not be able to do new things and, and push the boundaries. Um, technical stability was, was another thing. Um, this is the inside of the device. Uh, it's a bespoke, handmade hardware system, essentially. Um, and it takes a while to make it stable. And we weren't good enough in year one. We were much better in, in year two. Um, and also just a point about this is, this is what it's like making this stuff. And this is not a traditional heritage view, is it? So um, it, did, it does take a lot of getting used to. Uh, yeah, <laughs> glue guns are not, are not allowed, really. Um, so excuse this, this slide. Um, you know what this is, right? OK, good. This, may, we, this was big in our news as well. So, um, so working in, in the public realm, doing creative things in the public realm, which is why this is here. Um, 
is a challenge, you know. There's, uh, where we were is still the heart of government. It's, um, it's still the most um, guarded and protected and locked down area of, of the country. Uh, and it was a time of protest. There were, there were Brexit marches every weekend. There, were, there was, you know, so. And then this section here is just about um, the design principles that we've developed through this. So the first is that we are now in uh, a, an experience economy. People don't come to our places to find out facts. They go to Wikipedia to find out facts. And they come for experiences that can be social, emotional, or shareable. Uh, and our, we, we now, in creating experiences, have new competition. And our competitors are creating experiences. And all of the quotes on these next few slides are from actual visitors. Uh, the user-human interface, or the invisible interface, is, is, a, is a term I really like, which is about hiding. We all look, spend too much of our lives looking at screens. Um, so if you can hide the tech away, what it allows people to do is connect with it in a, um, is to connect with the story in a much more visceral or emotional way. And what we found from, the, from these quotes is that it, it, it really allows people to free their imaginations up. The visual, visual stimulus seems to be a very cerebral thing, and it, it kind of it ends there. Um, and a similar point that uh, virtual reality and augmented reality, we all always think of these as being visual things. But I, I would argue that we did create an augmented reality experience, but we put a layer of history around rather than, well, you'll see in a second. Uh, and virtual reality, I think it was a virtual world. It was a world that people spent uh, an hour and a half in quite happily. So, but. This is actually, this is one of the installations. So someone placed a Pokemon here. Uh, and the other thing is this film called Polar Express. And um, it's, it's a phrase called the Uncanny Valley. People are familiar with that, where it's from robotics and artificial intelligence, where the closer you get to human-like, the more freaked out we are by it. And so these, I mean, it's just horrible, isn't it? You know, there's no, it's really, but my, my point is a serious one, which is that, um, that I find this stuff a real barrier to empathy. Um, and we need, to, uh, we need to give our visitors the feeling that they're in control, the feeling that they're free, but we also need to look after them. So that getting that balance right between agency and kind of hosting is, is really important as well. The assumption that we are working under is that you understand the past best if you can make a connection to the characters that live there. If you can see yourself there, if you can find yourself in the past, and people engage with these human stories, um, and, and they need them to be believable humans to, to, in order to engage in this way. And what we found is that by using a, a range of different senses, um, it allows people to connect in a really, uh, in a kind of, yeah, emotional and visceral way that isn't possible just through, through visuals. And one woman came back to me, uh, I happened to be there when, when she'd finished the tour and said, how did you make the smell of smoke? And we hadn't, it, but it was a scene which was fire and we'd kind of used multi-sensory cues for fire, but there was none. So the, the kind of imagination does the rest more than we could ever do. So it's all about um, combining everything into these particular moments. And the key point here really is that this is not about technology at all. This is about technology being used to bring a story to life in a, in a particular way. And thinking about each of these moments in the way, how do you want the visitor to feel at that moment? And what have you got? What, what's the location? Is it new or is it old? Uh, what's the story? Who's going to be telling it? Um, what interaction can you... Um, can you give uh, through the technology? And, and then how can you mess with that? How can you know? How can you do the busker or the, or the, um, or the location? And what we found is that making um, people's actions the trigger for the digital technology was something that really freed up their imagination. So rather than it being a push button or a, or a kind of an obvious trigger, it was something they did with their body or something they did with a, a non-digital object. Um, so, I mean, you saw from the film that the kind of pinnacle of it was that during Charles I's execution scene, 
uh, while he was being marched to the scaffold, you actually held the device and it beated, it physically beated with a human heartbeat. And then when the axe fell, it stopped. Um, which I think is quite a personal, a powerful personal connection. Uh, a, a quite the thing we always say we want to do, which is make people step in the footsteps of, of people from the past. Um, and then what does this mean for us as organizations? Uh, if we're working in these new ways, when we're not actually saying what we should do, what is our job? Uh, and, and my point would always be that, that artists have visions, and that our job is to make sure that the visitor is always in that vision. And also, artists love uh, pro the process, and it's our job to make sure that that process ends up with a product that we can give those visitors. Um, and people often ask uh, how we persuaded the organization to do something uh, that was a little bit risky like this. And I, I just had to ask them to take a chance on me. <laughs> See? Um, no, I go back to that, because it was quite a big thing for them to do. So. Um, so w my point is that we shouldn't be doing different things. We should be doing things differently. And we should only use digital to do the things that we've always wanted to do but have never been able to do. So digital things should be impossibly analog. They should only be possible digitally. Um, and a lot of the, uh, the ways of working that I've been talking about now have been enabled by this scruffy room here called the R&D studio, the research and development studio, which is three uh, physical rooms at Hampton Court Palace that we can invite artists in as residents uh, for one, two, three, four weeks, right at the start of a project in order to find out if it's going to work, in order to allow them some time to really push ideas or directions. Um, and what we're seeing now, that's a few, we started that um, a few years ago, and we're now actually installing full visitor offers that have come through that um, process. I'll just whiz through a couple of these. So that was made in just two weeks, and um, we're now installing a much slicker, more kind of uh, thought through version of that. That will, um, what, what was so nice is that it actually puts you in the position of, of the cooks that would have stood there. So you're, it's like you're actually using that, that equipment, and you're just touching a, a something that should be there rather than um, an obvious piece of technology. We're doing a VR project. I don't think I've got time to talk um, too much about that. I'll just show you the quick. These guys are a bit creepy. <laughs> they are supposed to be dead. That, that's, uh... So I'll stop that. That's my friend. It's not fair to her. So that was just 10 days' work. That's why it's all a bit, it's all a bit shaky. But it's the idea that can we create virtual worlds where um, actual characters from the past reach in and, and grab you and touch you. Finally, it's not all digital stuff. Uh, we also use this space to tell history through drag queens and also feminist cabaret troops.
and that's it from me. Thank, Thank you. you. And I'm, I'm thinking that Gothenburg should take a chance on this and give us some money, money, money for the 400 years to play. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. A brilliant, a very beautiful project. So we don't have that much time for questions, but I just want to reflect on, you mentioned the, um, the notion of interface mm -hmm. and actions. And when you look up interface in a dictionary from the middle of the 19th century or late 18th century, interface was a very organic kind of activity mm -hmm. between two bodies. Exactly Exactly what you're describing here, but now with you know with the digitization, it's become to to mean something very more mm. unorganic and undynamic. You know the, the the computer interface and the human interface. And I think the rise of things like uh, Alexa and Echo, yeah. the, the kind of voice activation. Mm. I think that's going to be something that um, mm. the 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 way the digital world is embedded in the yes. physical world is going to just become much more enmeshed and invisible. Yes. So, and, and we look forward to more. Yeah. And take a chance to talk to him in the in the Thank you. interval. Yeah. Thank you.